T minus 17 seconds and counting. 15, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Go for main engine start. Main engine start. 2, 1, booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another conversation sheltered in place. I hope this finds everybody healthy and safe and navigating this great transition uh, that we're all in. Uh, this is our 13th episode, and I'm really excited about it. this uh, episode is going to focus on the sub-crisis uh, known as COVID-19, the sub-crisis of our overarching crisis known as 2020, uh, the crisis of 2020. So we're all uh, dealing with uh, with that as, as we speak. And so, uh, like I said, I'm really excited about this one. I have a, a, an incredible guest today. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation floating around. There's a lot of, you know, things like unproven and untested uh, uh, cures, um, silver bullets, uh, if you will. And so we're going to hear from a, from a real scientist. We're going to hear um, some real fact-based, evidence-based um, uh, reports on uh, what's going on uh, with COVID-19, uh, what we can expect in the next few weeks, and um, how we're going to get out of this. And so my guest today is Dr. Natalie Dean. And Natalie is a member of the faculty of the University of Florida, and she's in the Department of Biostatistics, specializing in infectious disease, epidemiology, and study design. Her research focuses on innovative trial designs for evaluating vaccines targeting emerging pathogens like Ebola, Zika, and COVID-19. She previously worked as a consultant with the World Health Organization on HIV drug resistance surveillance. Dr. De Dr. Dean received her PhD in biostatistics from Harvard uh, and performed her postdoctoral work at the University of Florida. She has been active in science communications during the COVID-19 pandemic with recent published pieces in the Washington Post, New York Times, and Medscape. She's also currently working with the WHO on COVID-19 vaccine trials and is involved with the COVID tracking pro project. So everybody, please, uh, help me welcome Dr. Natalie Dean to the conversation. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Ron. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, so just maybe to start off, you know, I I didn't I didn't know there was a, a, a major or, you know, a PhD you can get in biostatistics before. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe can you can you tell us your story? You know, how you got interested in biostatistics, what biostatistics is? Uh, and what was your path and, and where, you, where, where are you going on that path? Absolutely. I didn't know what biostatistics was until somewhere midway through my college, <laughs> my time in college. So I originally in high school, I realized I wanted to work in infectious disease and diseases. I um, learned about HIV. I learned about Ebola and I recognized, you know, how big of an impact those diseases had on you know, different populations and how you know, people need to be healthy, uh, the importance of human health for, you know, for everything. Um, so I decided I wanted to go into microbiology, but then I realized I really hated working at the bench and working like at the lab. I'm not a very exact, I'm not really good at measuring things and I don't know, I'm a little sloppy. So, um, so about midway through, I started working with this, um, epidemiologist who was doing a, a nutritional study in, in um, Barbados and I started working on that and she's the one who encouraged me to go into biostats because um, I realized it's a way to use my skills in math which is something I've always liked and just had a natural affinity for um, and apply them to something you know very useful for um, for public health which is what, the quantitative cousin of epidemiology okay. uh, but they're very very closely linked and overlap a lot in what they do super well I want to welcome everybody who's uh, who's tuning in and this is a conversation shelter in place but it's not just between two people it's all, all you guys are, are involved in this conversation too so give us your questions and your comments and uh, we'll do the best we can to to address them. Um, you know, I, I was looking at the John Hopkins um, tracking uh, chart just just a little while ago, and we've had two days in a row now with over 60,000 new cases. 
So we're in uh, quite a, it seems like quite a spike. We're, we're going in the wrong direction. So can you give us just, uh, you know, a status of where you think we are right now and, and how we got there and how we're going to turn it around? Yeah, we're definitely seeing, uh, you know, a lot of states are having real growth in their epidemics. And, you know, there's, there was definitely, we're in a different situation than we were in March and April when there was very little testing. So we have a lot more testing. So the apps, it's a little hard to compare the absolute numbers um, just because we're uncovering more of the mild infections that we were totally missing before when we were only getting people once they came to the hospital. But it's the, the growth is very fast and the growth is very concerning. And that the fact that we're seeing um, these increases in hospitalizations and, you know, we know that there are these lags. So once we see a rise in hospitalizations, then subsequently we're going to see a rise in deaths. So we're in a difficult spot right now. And what I wish we were seeing more of is a is a, a will to to step back from where we are and really re-examine the policies. Um, because you know, for example, we know bars are a high risk uh, venue when you have indoor settings where there's a lot of close conversation. And I think there's is, there's some, been some movement to close some bars in some states or in some places they just set a curfew. But I think you know when we think about really getting things under control we need to identify there are certain high risk venues that should be closed um, right now. So, so yeah, I, I wish there was a little more willingness to um, step back from some of these policies. Yeah. yeah. Slow things down. Right. So uh, Thomas uh, Dolores says pandemics are a part of history. We need to understand them as much as any other part of history. I, I think unfortunately when historians look back at 2020, there might be a lot of things uh, that we can that we did wrong, um, uh, and so and, and I think one of the things that we're doing that we're not doing so well <laughs> is is communication. There's a lot of miscommunication going on, um, and and this leads to behavior. And so I've I've seen many many people quote 99 percent like 99 percent of the people that get this um, are going to be just fine. What, it, what is the statistic on how many people that are infected yet get some type of, of symptoms uh, that, let's say, would cause them to lose, lose work efficiency, let's say? Yeah, we're still figuring a lot of that out, and it varies a lot by age, definitely. Um, so... Yeah, that's a good question. I've seen estimates that are around um, 10, um, I'm reluctant to put out numbers that I'm not quite <laughs> not quite sure about, but um, yeah, like the, at least 10% or some big, fairly big fraction of people uh, who are detected need, need to be hospitalized. I don't, I don't want to throw out too many numbers, but the, uh, yeah, but um but I, I think, I think it, misses, is, it, it misses a point that yeah. that the um, a lot of people are being a, a lot of people are at risk of being infected. And when you see really big numbers of people being infected, yeah. even if something is fairly rare, uh, relatively rare, um, then you're going to see a lot of severe outcomes. So what you know. It, if, if millions of people are being infected, even something that's reasonably rare is going to lead to a lot of deaths. And we also really don't understand the long-term outcomes. I mean, even some of the people who are classified as having mild illness, like it didn't require hospitalization, are still having really some weird symptoms. And this is a new virus and we don't understand all of its features. So if, you know, a few months after you had some kind of mildish illness, you're still having trouble breathing, or you're waking up in the night and having trouble breathing. We don't understand how long that's going to last. So in these types of situations, we want to approach this with caution because we don't, we, what we don't want to end up with is a, is a big fraction of the, you know, the, this pop, the population that um, has some disability, like right. a, a, you know, a young, healthy person having chronic breathing problems. Right, permanent, permanent, causing permanent damage. And I mean, I think the bottom line is that we need to take this seriously, um, and and we're not always taking it seriously. So the reported deaths, Evan um, is asking, are they including the people who died that had preconditions? Yes, those are people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so. 
if you think about the U.S., um, a huge fraction of people have some sort of risk factor, diabetes, um, you know, like two thirds of the country is overweight. I mean, a third of the country is, is obese. These are risk factors. Like a lot of people have diabetes. Um, a lot of people are over 65. Uh, and, you know, so, so yes, it includes that. That's, that's our population makeup. Um, so it's, there are, there are serious outcomes that occur in people without these risk factors, but there are serious you know, outcomes that occur in people with the risk factors, and, but they're all people in our population that we want to protect. Right. And as we said earlier, you know, there's been for the last two days in a row, over 60,000 new cases reported. And a lot of people downplay that because they say, well, that's just a result of us testing more. But I guess a key statistic is the percentage of the people tested that are testing positive, right? Because if it's simply just more tests, you would see that number go down, right? And so where where are we with that? Do you know? Yeah, well, that's one of the metrics we've been tracking because of course, if you do more testing, you will uncover more of the cases that were being missed before. The really the the really mild ones, um, particularly in young people, these can be um, they might have just like a little sore throat or, or even no symptoms at all. And so some places are doing, you know, workplace testing or they have these big campaigns where they go out and test people routinely. And so, you you know, you're going to see um, uh, more things detected there. But if if it's just more testing, then we're going to just have we're going to have more negative tests um, because if we're just if we're testing lower and lower risk people, then we're going to have uh, the more of those tests are going to come back negative. When we have a brewing outbreak, um, then that's when we start to see those uh, that uh, percent positive creep back up. So, uh, so and we're seeing that actually spike in some places. I know today in Miami Dade County, it was about, um, it was up to like over a third of tests were came back positive. And we're seeing similar things in places in Texas. Um, and Arizona. And those are really, those are startling numbers for, for those particular regions. Other places like New York, they have things under, under control and they're doing more testing, but they're seeing very low percent positivity, like 2% ish. Um, and so it, uh, so yeah, we're tracking the percent positivity along with hospitalizations, along with the death numbers and, and um, all of those signal that there's a real, a real problem. Okay. And so, I mean, can you, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but can you, can you forecast? I mean, I, I guess it's not too hard to forecast two weeks out, right? I mean, 14 days out because there's a, there's precursors that point directly to what's going to happen. So what, what is, what are things going to look like in two weeks, you think? Unfortunately, I think we're going to see a spike in deaths um, in the places that are hardest hit. And so Arizona, Texas, and Florida, come to mind, I think we are going to start seeing um, uh, increasing numbers of daily deaths. We had that the numbers have been declining for so long. And that was, you know, great. That demonstrated a, a hard work and, and success. But I do think that those numbers, I would, you know, given that ICUs are starting to develop, I would, ex I would expect those numbers to, to go back up in certain spots. So. Yeah. Now, I know, I know this is a very complex question. Um, but how did we get here? <laughs> I mean, why, why? <laughs> I don't know. Because if you look, if you look at some of the other countries around the world, they, they seem to have, you know, conquered this thing, uh, more or less. And here we are, you know, really spiking hard. Um, what, what, what did we not do that we should have done? What did, what did we do that we shouldn't have done? You know, what can we learn from this so that we can put this behind us, hopefully? Yeah, the, I mean, the absence of like a really coordinated federal strategy is makes things really challenging. Um, there, the states are, are are doing their own things, and they're they're making um, you know the governors are figuring out their own plans. But there are a lot of resources that, that the federal government can free up and deploy um, that that that's not been done. And uh, but what, what kind of concrete things would have been done if, if we were able to do that? Yeah, I think um, there, well, there were a lot of problems early on with testing. That's just, that's one example. And that had to do with kind of some red tape at the FDA with how tests are approved. And there, I mean, there, there are these processes that are in place um, that are there to safeguard people and there to make sure that 
tests are only put out if they're of high enough quality for use. But it ended up being a real roadblock at a time when we needed things unstuck. And so that is where you know someone should have stepped in to to um, to fix that bottleneck. So that's one you know one example. I mean, examining our supply chains. There we've had real issues with our supply chains, and so. Um, figuring out the pressure points there and trying to anticipate in the future where those pressure points are going to exist. Um, and then I think a big thing too is how the, the role that the CDC has played in the response. And I mean, you talk about um, having clear evidence-based information to educate people. And the CDC has been relatively quiet throughout this in terms of um, their the information they're providing. And I think that the, uh, there's an important role for them to play in educate, you know, being a trusted source for the public that is not being used to its the, the full extent. There, there's great talent at the CDC, and they're not. Um, that's not being leveraged. Yeah. 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 Um, so here's here's a long comment um, from Maya. How can we apply the orbital perspective to the coronavirus pandemic and the rest of what's going on in the world uh, and USA right now? Um, what are some suggestions to apply the orbital perspective? So what, what that you question, have to tell me what the orbital what perspective that, is. What that question means is um, ba basically I, I wrote a book called The Orbital Perspective, and it's basically a book about collaboration. Um, and, you know, I've made a, a few posts saying that COVID-19 is not a global pandemic. It's a planetary plan pandemic. And when we treat things from a global point of view, um, we treat people as as numbers on a on a spreadsheet, and uh, we we treat things at best probably in a national from a national point of view. And so, uh, you know, I think one of the things to talk about is the fact that this is an undeniable planetary uh, pandemic. It's a planetary crisis, and the only way that it can be effectively solved is by solving it as a planetary community. Uh, in in cooperation and collaboration and information sharing and you know when eventually we'll have a vaccine that you know how does that vaccine get distributed it has to be a coordinated um very you know very very collaborative um uh, effect so that, that's just my two cents on the overall perspective but, but i don't know if you have anything to add to that well that, that's a good segue into how do we get out of this mess <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, well you're speaking my language when it comes to learning from other places and um and in collaboration and and there have been some really incredible successes i so i work with the World Health Organization on the, some of the, the strategizing around vaccines. And there really has been um, great coordination with scientists um, in terms of open data sharing, like, um, and really um, just working together as a, as a global community of scientists to really accelerate at all possible ways development of vaccines. Because there are a lot of steps involved um, in find, you know, figuring out the right animal studies and and getting the early you know the getting the right um, assays and getting the right um, early studies done and sharing this information getting everything set up and there has been really great you know success there I think I've seen a lot of great collaboration with um, scientists uh, it's just you know where the, the politics are clearly more complicated um, but um, but yeah, I really think everything we can do to learn from other places, particularly because a lot of places have um, more experience dealing with infectious diseases. Uh, for example, I mean, low and middle income countries um, that that where infectious diseases are a big part of their their health burden, then they have these systems set up, you know, to do community health education to do contact tracing they have these protocols in place they have these experiences and I don't know that we're doing you know what I've been trying to emphasize is learning more from other countries that have these sets of ex experiences um, because in fact the US uh, we don't do a ton of contact tracing because there's only a few diseases like measles and you know some um, sexually transmitted diseases that require those types of systems and we um, we would be remiss not to learn from the, right. the experiences of others now. Right. So, I mean, we had, we had a conversation um, before a few days ago where uh, if I, if, if I remember correctly, you said uh, we know exactly how to get out of this. It's, and we're, it's just very, very difficult. 
right? I mean, <laughs> well, we have a lot of. I mean, there are countries that are having success, and but and they're not all doing the same thing, which is very useful. And mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, there are countries in all global regions that are, you know, that are making things work with a different using a different playbook. And so that to me indicates that it doesn't need to be the exact same thing, but it needs to be some locally adapted version of some of these things. And it's it's not going to be one silver bullet, but it's it's going to be um, kind of throwing the book at it as much as we can do that that works. So, you know, mask wearing has an incremental value. Moving more things outdoors has an incremental value. Um, you know, people continuing to kind of work from home or have some some sustainable changes to our behavior that has incremental value. Um, and then uh, and then the the contact tracing. I mean, it's those things require a lot of work or getting more testing uh, out there requires a lot of work, but it can really, these are the cornerstones that we know um, can help us live more safely. And mm -hmm. so it's really about, you know, the rubber meeting the road and, and building up these things that are going to allow us to, to live safely. Yeah. And if you were, if you could cherry pick, you know, the things that, that, are happening around the world that are showing promise, you know, what can you do? And, and just, just pop this up from New York or Keith Heitner, isn't the way out to do what we did here in New York. Um, so I don't know if you, if you have expertise in what went, what went on in New York and what we can learn from that or, or in New Zealand or anywhere else in the world that has, has um, had progress in, in turning the curve around. Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting because we're all, go, you know, every place is going through the same thing. And so and early on, there were only a few places that were having success, like South Korea, you know, Singapore. And, and but since then, more places have been added on. Um, and and so right, New York and Massachusetts right now, you know, there's there are places that are having more um, success. I mean, they're they're taking a, a slow and steady strategy, and I, I think also you know, it, there is a role to having gone through it for, firsthand and, and seeing at a local level the impact because I, I do think there is a mentality that persists in other places in the country, like and it can't happen here or the it's overblown, and um, so just in terms of getting the the communities engaged and you know willing to stick with the the guidelines and being supportive of governments and taking a slow and steady strategy, going through firsthand the experience um, of, of having a large outbreak nearby. You know, I, I wish that places didn't have to learn the, those lessons the hard way, but it, you know, it's, it, it's something worth studying how that contributes to, to actual adherence to, to different policies. Well, here's a concrete example right here. Tarver Lowe says, we're dealing with the difficult decision of sending our kids back to school August 4th. What do we know about children and transmission and how great a risk reopening schools are to families? Yeah, and that is like the million dollar question. And I don't have a great answer. The, it's What's been challenging is we don't have a lot of great studies yet on what is happening with kids there were some lost opportunities with schools opening up in certain countries to really study what was what was going on exactly there also the some of those places where schools have opened up have been places where there wasn't a lot of transmission in the community so they're in a different situation than we are here right now in many places in, in the u.s what we what we seem to know about kids is that they well certainly they don't ex exhibit symptoms as often as adults um, but we can't quite tell if they're being infected less often or if they're being in, they're just as likely to be infected. You know, they could be infected less often because their immune systems are different. But it could also be because they've been at home. You know, their their daily interactions have changed so dramatically, whereas adults, many adults are still you know going to work. Kids are largely kind of still still at home. So just their exposure profile has changed. Right. And when we think about them going back to school, you know, kids have a lot of contacts at school. So we don't know how that will change. And then we also don't know how infectious kids are once once infected. Um, the, it seems to be that the, there's not a lot of evidence of kids spreading to others. Um, but 
from we but we know with other coronaviruses that kids can so so that's where it's we're in this weird situation where just because we don't have evidence that it's happening doesn't mean that it it, it doesn't so um, certainly the decision makers are, are everyone's really I, I don't come down on, on on really particular side with this issue because I know about the importance of of schools just as a public good um, for for kids development and for communities but it's it's a really difficult situation and I think the best thing we can do is try and uh, find ways to keep transmission in the communities low. I think that's going to be the best way to keep right. schools safe and and families right. safe. And 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 at the end of the day, it's a personal decision too, because you know there's a lot of factors that go into that decision. Like, are there at risk people back at home that Absolutely. when the, when the child when the student comes back home, they're basically every person that they came in contact with, every kid, every teacher uh, that they came in contact with is basically a potential threat to to the person at home who's compromised in some way. Yeah. So having flexibility for people navigating their own, you know, situations. Um, yeah, because it may not be the same same answer for, for everyone. OK, I got a good statistician question for you. Okay. Any updates on how blood types are affected by COVID-19? Yeah, I've seen this. Um, I, you know, I didn't look too closely at the at the quality of the study, but I, someone I trust said that it was from a group they trust. So for whatever that's worth, <laughs> but there was, there was some evidence that um, people with uh, type O blood are less likely to, to be infected, but that's, you know, it's those types of, um, I, I don't know how compelling that evidence is. So mm -hmm. I think um, I wouldn't, you know, I have type, Oh, blood, and I'm not, you know, running out, <laughs> changing, changing my behavior because of it. Uh, I would wait until there's a little more consensus. But, but you know, it's a, it's 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 an open it's an open question. Yeah. Sure. So, so just yesterday on the radio here in Colorado, I heard uh, requests for volunteers for a COVID nineteen vaccine trial. So, where where are we at with that? I mean, uh, is, is there do you see anything any promising trends or any any promising uh, developments on the on the vaccine horizon yeah so the the um, the interesting thing about vaccines I mean we are pursuing so many different vaccine candidates in parallel um, lots of different technologies so it's not all of our eggs in one basket there's like a hundred different things being developed there's you know probably at least 20 that are already in um, in human trials there so there are different phases of development and uh, and they're moving through these steps. They start out in these very small trials where we're really just checking safety and we're looking at your immune response. And then what I work on are the big trials. So once you start, you, you um, have thousands of people and you're, and you're vaccinating them or you're randomizing them to either vaccine or placebo and you're seeing, you're comparing which, um, how many people uh, get, get sick. Uh, across the two groups to see if there's if the vaccine has any protect a uh, protective effect um, for actually preventing disease among people who are out and about um, and uh, yeah so those those are starting to those are starting um, so we there is already one vaccine maybe two vaccines that are in these big trials um, and I would expect big trials in the U.S. to start soon they'll probably be evaluating kind of several vaccines at once. Um, and uh, yeah, it's so that that work is moving very quickly. Um, and and it's also, you know, even if the first one doesn't work out, or the second one doesn't work out, like there are a lot waiting in the wings. So there's, you know, and because they use different technologies, there's more opportunity for one of them to, to be successful. Right, yeah. right. But if we get one that is successful, then, you know, manufacturing distribution, you know, that's a whole nother you know, bunch of months that goes on the end of that. And and Evan made a comment, um, basically, is it true that we have a vaccine uh, ready for December? And I, I've heard that as well. I've heard reports that there's a vaccine that should be ready in December. Have, uh, is there any truth to that? It seems a little ambitious to me that that, that timeline seems a little quick. Um, I, I don't know what ready means. You know, it's, so so if the trials are going to start within the next few months you know or some of them have some of them have already started but it would you know it would get it would take until kind of the early fall mid fall to 
have kind of some answers, whether it works um, for at least that's just for the first batch. And then, yeah, and then it, and then, then you have to do the manufacturing and, and the distribution. So um, I, I think that's a bit optimistic. I, you know, we may, we may be in a situation where we can start rolling out vaccine to sort of certain high risk sort of targeted, very strategic populations. Um, but in, you know, you and me, like just people in the, in the community, uh, that, that seems, it seems ambitious. Yeah. Is there anything out there that, that, that gives you some, some level of optimism? I know we talked about monoclonal antibodies. Um, <laughs> is that something worth talking about? Yeah. Well, I, you know, there are improvements in care and treatment. Um, it's, it is so far they've been a little incremental, it, you know, it's, what we had, what we've been testing in terms of treatments have been the treatments that we already kind of had off the shelf. And so that includes uh, antivirals that could be used for a bunch of other, it may have been developed for other diseases. Um, but but coming down the line are, are drugs that are actually have been manufactured that specifically target this virus. So they're specific to this virus. And so those would seem and to just be- just to be clear, these are not, these don't prevent you from getting it. This, If you have it, this helps you get better. Right. Yes. Yeah. There, are, there is also research into things like um, called uh, like prophylactic agents. So um, something that like a healthcare worker could take, or if you mm -hmm. get sick and a um, and your you, your family members might yeah. take like two weeks of a, of a drug. So yeah. those are being studied. Yeah. Um, sort of like Tamiflu, right? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. Or like yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's something came out just a few days ago in the New England Journal. I, I don't mean to suggest that it is Tamiflu. I just said like. No. To. No. No. But let that idea. That yeah. I, yeah. So so you can use these things as a as a prophylaxis targeted pro antiviral prophylaxis, and so that's um. So yeah, though that that things that's encouraging. But then also we're learning a lot more about the disease. So when we think we're learning more about the role of cardiovascular symptoms, so like stroke, and so we have all these antithrombotic drugs. There's all these drugs on the shelf that now clinicians are starting to study, and then can be you know studied uh, in trials, and we can see you know those those carry promise as well for. Um, helping more people yeah, survive who, who get, you know, uh, uh, sick, uh, primarily people who are hospitalized. But, but we can also start thinking about, you know, we're also thinking about what are the drugs that you could take earlier in the course of illness that can prevent you from getting severely ill. Mm -hmm. So there, the, the approach that um, the National Institutes of Health is talking about now is dividing up illness into these phases and really kind of trying to like target for particular phases. What are the drugs for each kind of phase that we're studying. Yeah. So just going back to uh, the vaccine for a second, Thomas says he, that he heard that they are manufacturing ahead of time, the vaccines, uh, in, ca in case they the, the trials succeed. Um, it, yeah. I mean, that's obviously something that could save a lot of time, right? But that, of course, that's a big investment um, that yeah. companies have to make with no guarantee yeah. of a payback. Yeah, right, right. So that's been the, so what we call like the pandemic paradigm is how do you shave off time in this, in this process? And so, uh, so part of it has been investment from, you know, other organizations like the Gates Foundation has um, invested a lot of money in, in, in getting that, the, the manufacturing set up even without, you know, it's a, it's a risky investment, right? But it, but the, the potential value in terms of, month so, saved and uh, yeah. yes yes exactly right so um so yes that has been the the the, the, the new approach um in how we're trying to save time so yes okay. and because let me add to that because not you know not all the 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 different vaccines that are being pursued have different technologies some are easier to manufacture than others um, and some of the ones that are furthest along are kind of using a newer technology that's meant to be kind of fast to to get going, but we don't have a lot of experience manufacturing it. So it's some of the ones that are coming up in on the rear that we have a lot more experience with. Um, and so when we think about developing vaccines, that's why we're not just trying to develop one. We're trying, you know, we want a diverse set of options because that Right then, we're then we're reducing the burden on one particular, you know, supply chain. Um, so 
So that's another way we're distributing the risk. So uh, in the, in the vein of not putting all our eggs in one basket, we can't assume that we are going to have a vaccine. So, you know, that would, you know, certainly having a vaccine would be that everybody ha has access to. Uh, and everybody, when I say everybody, I mean, everybody in the world, because <laughs> it only takes, you know, it, it only takes one to start it back up again. Right. And so, you know, to really, you know, end COVID-19 for good, we would have to have a, a, a vaccine that works, you know, a hundred percent of the time and given to every person on the planet. So short of that, um, what are, you know, what are some things that, what are some concrete things? I know we talked a little bit about this, but can we just be you know, like really systematic and what, what do we need to do right now to, to first of all, turn this curve around and, and hopefully get it back down near zero? Yeah. So we have to learn how to live safely, right? Because besides the fact that we're, we don't, we can't predict the future and we don't know what's going to happen with vaccine development. Um, we, yeah, we, we know that we have, more time now where we don't have a vaccine in, but we need to be able people need to be able to live safely and um and we want you know we want these systems so that where things flare up uh, we we know how to respond and we're ready to respond um i you know the 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 key there's okay so there's a number of key elements i think continued more emphasis on testing and ease of testing. Um, right now, the tests we do, they are these, these laboratory tests and they need to go to like the lab and they have, there's a turnaround time and they're slow. And, um, and so that creates a lot of bottlenecks. And when we think about like how a lab, you know, if I knew right away what my results were, then that could really change my behavior. And um, so anything that makes testing easier, so these uh, development of, of rapid diagnostic tests. Um, so there's discussion about like pregnancy type kind of looking tests where, you know, you, you spit into a cup and then it can, you can get like a rapid result um, or, or saying with like, even like looks like a little paper test. And so, if you can imagine, you know, that these things are moving along and, and hopefully the FDA and the you know, government will be supportive of, of approving some of these. Have, technologies. You, have you heard where we are with that? Because actually a, a few weeks ago, I had a guest on who has a company who's doing that, just that, trying to get in-home, you know, rapid testing uh, approved. Um, but I, had, I haven't heard where we're at with that. Have you? Yeah, I, I think things are, are moving along. It's just if we want to there's some concern about what's going to be approved as well. Um, there are safeguards in place, you know, to, to, to protect people. You only want tests that are of high enough quality, uh, but there, there is a, a, a bit of a balance here where there could, you know, even a less sensitive test, you know, so produces some false negatives. If you had, uh, you know, but if it were really cheap and really fast, like think about what it could pick up that would otherwise be missed. Uh, so the, you know, another, the thing has been this pool testing where you pool lots of specimens together. Um, and we've been talking about, so, so instead of testing one, one person, you, you combine samples from 20 people and then you test that. And if it's negative, everyone's negative. Um, and so you can save money that way. But the FD, we've been talking about that for months, but the FDA has been really slow to approve those protocols. So I'm not quite sure what's Go, there's yeah. like a step there. I'm not quite sure what's happening, but there's a bottleneck. Yeah. So Su Susanna asking it is is asking is there any way this this could be fast tracked? You know, the home, in home testing. Yeah. So I mean, so so I'm not sure of exactly what the what the bottlenecks are there in terms of the approval. But yes, I'm very supportive of of anything that gets these out. You know, uh, faster because these these slow turnaround times are really killing us. And if yeah. you if you can imagine, even if it's not a perfect test, but if you can imagine something where you can at least screen large numbers of people pretty quickly and pick up some of what's going on, how that would really change how we could live, you know, our lives in a in a safe safer way. Right. I, I guess the issue there would be, you know, if you if it's not sufficiently tested and, and there's false negatives. Uh, yes, you know, false that negatives is the, are really dangerous because people change their behavior based on their negative, and so. Right, right. Yeah. But in my mind, it's like, if you can start to pick up enough of the positives, then you really, you start changing the dynamics of the outbreak. And so you start if where, where you can prevent those people from spreading onwards, 
then you're you're changing how much disease virus there is in the community and so then then it's um that you know because if each person is is spreading to you know some number more people like when you start to weed you start to break those chains of transmission you, you don't need to be perfect i think to really make things safer mm -hmm. um but yes there's always question about you know how people change their their behavior you know there's the same topic about masks and like people are going to all of a sudden be not as safe because they're wearing masks or something. But it's usually the evidence is a little thin that people actually change their behavior to, to act in a much riskier way just because, you know, so. Um, yeah. I would hope yeah. though, if it was positive <laughs> that they would put masks on. <laughs> well, if it's positive, they should go uh, home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, okay, so, so we have testing. Um, and oh, okay. just going back to the pool testing, I don't know if this is, what you mean by pool testing, but I've heard of nursing homes where they'll come in and they'll test every resident of a nursing home and the an entire staff, you know, in a matter of hours. Um, and then, th and then based on that, because it all happened at the same time, they could change, potentially change the way they're doing business. Um, yeah, that, um, so, so that's, that's like a testing campaign or just, you know, uh, workplace testing. And that's just like, or you're testing a lot of people. And, um, but pool testing is, is a way to make that cheaper. Yeah. Okay. So like if you, if, you know, think about, um, like sports teams or that, that's something that's being discussed a lot for sports teams. Like you say, you just, you get everyone together and you, you know, you test them and then, um, and then you, you can just. Yeah, because you expect people to be negative. So when you expect people to be negative, it's a really cost effective thing because you expect the pool to be negative. Um, and so uh, because if, if the pool comes back positive a lot, then you have to test everyone individually and you didn't really save the money or time. Um, but it's a it's a way to to do things more efficiently. OK, so we're making a list for <laughs> not, many, not in any particular order, but number one is the list of things we need to do to get out of this mess that we're in. And number one is to test test more, test more frequently, have quicker results on those testing. And and then then that gives us um, the data that we need to, to be able to know what to do, basically. Yeah, so. I just think it, it feeds back into how people behave because I mean, it's right now we have to act like everyone could be infected right. but if we had better eyes on the problem then you know people we can we can sort of we can identify where the chains of transmission are and then and then focus our efforts there um and so it's because right now we're you know in many ways we're still blind about where where things are yeah. um so and because people can spread without knowing that you know they can spread before they develop symptoms so that that's been a major challenge is that people um, can sort of inadvertently spread the virus. So anything that can help us get better eyes on on where things are, and 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 so anything that makes testing easier, mm -hmm. more efficient. So there's like more you know saliva based protocols instead of having that thing shoved up your nose, and anything that makes it more like yeah. easier for for people to get tested um, sure. is useful. Yeah. Okay, so so we we need more testing, but but, but more testing is not going to get us out because if you test negative, that just means that you were not infected up until the point where you got tested. Yeah. So so yeah. so what else, what else, what's number two on the list? Well, I guess this is in no particular order, but yeah. but yeah. Um, you know, I clear clear messaging and education. I think people are very confused and. Um, it's going to require individual action to it, it help people understand really what are the uh, high and low risk things. What it, you know, um, there's a lot of confusion about mask wearing, and there's a uh, there's a lot of confusion about like to people you know on the news they'll show pictures of beaches uh, as like oh you know Florida's outbreak is crazy. Look at these beaches, but then does that convey the message that beaches are high risk? Because we actually don't. Have any evidence that that's the case you know we we know what we have is evidence against bars and indoor you know indoor activities um with uh churches with singing anything where there's like a lot of vocalization karaoke bars um these keep coming up from other countries and from the us as places where we're seeing these these clusters so just clearer messaging about what 
what actually is a high and low risk. Yeah. So, so you, you say there's a lot of miscommunication, but is there a lot of miscommunication among experts? I mean, I know there, that the different news organizations report differently, but uh, amongst the scientists and the, and the statisticians and everything else, is there, is there, is there any consensus amongst the experts on, on what needs to be done? On what needs to be done? Um, yeah. Uh, like on the, like the importance of wearing a mask, the importance of social distancing, you know, is there any, is there, is there a consensus among scientists or, or are scientists arguing about that too? Well, scientists are, are people and they can be, you know, some, some can be strong willed. So, it, you know, it, so there's always, there's always some disagreement, but, but I'd say there's broad consensus around, around what, what needs to be done. Um, it's, you know, what what you might prioritize as the first thing maybe you know but but i think people all agree that there's um there's like a set of things that that we need need to be working on the the messaging around masks has been a bit confusing and um and then the role of like the, the mode of transmission whether it's from the droplets or whether it's something that kind of is a drop like hangs in the air a little longer or you know there's there are some stuff where it gets into this weird scientific debate, but I think that for practical purposes, we have a, a you know a pretty good sense of what are the you know what are the high risk things, and it's these conversations indoors, um, crowded situations where there's a lot of talking and singing, yelling. People are close together, and there it's, that's where we're seeing these big clusters of transmission. Those are the high risk the highest risk activities, making sure people really understand that. We're coming into election season and there's you know, potential for a lot of political rallies. Um, those seem like pretty dangerous places to be. So. Yeah, just anything where there's a lot of people indoor, particularly where there's yelling. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's not clear like if everyone was in a room and they were quiet, that there would be high risk. Yeah. <laughs> like if everyone, you know, it's not clear to me that movie theaters are high risk. Um, we don't really have a lot of evidence about that. It's not clear to me that airplanes are high risk because people kind of just sit quietly. Um, but where people are yelling, yes, I would. Yes, yeah. that is high risk. Definitely. So there, there are some specific questions uh, about this. But um, well, one goes back to to the uh, the pool pool testing question. Wouldn't pool testing be good for safely opening schools if staff could be uh, pool test. And that's from Carlene. And by the way, there's people tuning in from all over the world. We even have a visitor from star city, Russia. So, Hey, Sasha. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Pool testing is being explored primarily for these type situations where you have like, you're at a workplace or you're, you're somewhere where people are frequently gathering. They're kind of already together and you just want to check them at once in like a, you know, in a, in a cost of cost effective way. Um, so, so yes, those are that's definitely one of the places pool testing is, is being discussed with schools. But the yeah. challenge is not all school systems are going to have the same set of resources and um, to implement all of these policies. And so what are we doing to support our school system so that they can implement these safely? So, and, um, Susanna is asking about the consensus on flushing toilets. That, that Does that cause transmissions? You know, we don't know. Um, so... Uh, so SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS, there were some clusters um, linked to faulty plumbing that uh, with the with the toilets, and um, and there's there's some evidence that there that 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 could happen with this virus as well. Certainly, they're related viruses, so we expect somewhat similar behavior. There's no. Um, so I'm not an expert in all the like the aerosol science and the, what the little droplets and all those things, but um, but yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. It's it's clearly not the main mode of how things are spreading. You know, we we have a we have a pretty good sense of the the main way things are spreading, but um, I'm not going to say no because I'm not sure. Yeah, it's it's possible. Yeah. Okay, so we got two. We got more testing. We've got uh, better communication on the things to do. So what what. It, what else do we got? Yeah, the 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 contact tracing. So you know, it's contact tracing both as a way of um, rooting out more cases, rooting out more of these chains of transmission, trying to break the chains of transmission by 
tracking people down, telling them to safely isol uh, to quarantine, uh, monitor their symptoms, and so to prevent them from spreading to others. And then also as a data collection mechanism. So contact tracing is very valuable because what we do is we can identify the likely source of infection for people. And as we gather information, we can identify, start, you know, start to really get a good handle on what are the high risk activities, what are the, lo the lower risk activities. Because part of living safely is really being able to distinguish what is, you know, what is high and low risk. Um, so, so, uh, so definitely, um, Contact tracing, is, so in Massachusetts, they've been pursuing that quite aggressively. Um, I know New York is working on that as well, and it's a lot of work, uh, but it's a way to, to live safely, and it's a, it's a way to also, in the future, prevent flare-ups. So it's difficult to do contact tracing when there's like a lot of transmission in the community. The numbers get difficult, um, but, but it's, you know, when we think about it, it it can still pick off these these chains, and then in the future, when numbers are lower, then that's what prevents a flare up. Yeah. So it's it, you have these systems kind of ready to go. That's what we wanted to have in place at the start of the epidemic. Well, but we you, know, you said that you weren't sure if if a movie theater was safe or not, but, but from a contact tracing point of view, avoiding any large gathering. Because it'd be pretty hard if you were in a movie theater, a fully packed movie theater, and then a day later you tested positive. You know, it'd be pretty hard to contact trace. <laughs> well, right, know. right. So, so then there are other systems where you can, you know, what other countries have is like apps or things where you can sort of signal, okay, some there was a possible exposure at this venue. So, uh -huh. like, and so, and then, then it's you don't need to have identified all those people. Sure, sure, sure. People can kind of keep an eye on things. So there's like nice apps in like Vietnam and South Korea and you, and then people can voluntarily get tested. So if, um, if, if people have a, a potential exposure. So yeah, and that's because more of the, some of the motivation behind some of like the, the digital contact tracing apps where the, it's the Bluetooth is kind of saying hello to all the other phones and it's like a privacy preserving thing because it's just, it's, they're just kind of pinging each other. It's not saying where they were, but, um, but if if you were in the same vicinity as someone who tests positive, then you could be notified and then um, and then voluntarily seek testing. There's challenges with just the implementation of that. It's sort of difficult to do it in a way such that your phone's not blowing up all the time or you know, like it, um, there's a balance with false positives. But uh, but but that's another technology that's that's yeah. been discussed. Yeah. Is there is there a privacy issue pushback on contact tracing? Yeah. Oh, oh um, yeah. So on the regular, like the like where someone calls you up and. Well, just the the, the concept. You know, I'm sure that I mean, there's different. There's many different ways, as you as you've explained, uh, to do yeah. contact tracing, and I guess some of them probably would have privacy issues, or people would have privacy. Yeah, issues. yeah, and so that's been um, a challenge because as part of it relies on trust, and so a huge a huge aspect is finding ways to to make um, help people um, feel you know, feel safer sharing their information. So one way is like getting a better caller ID on the person who's calling you so people actually answer the phone or having someone, um, you know, how the contact tracers navigate that conversation in a way that makes people feel safe. All of these contribute um, to better success. I mean, there's concerns from like undocumented immigrants about being exposed in a way that they're going to get deported or so then they're less like, you know, but when we think about public health, it's about, you know, we want to find every every case we can. Um, and so there's a balance there. Recently in South Korea, there were some large um, outbreaks related to nightclubs and some of them were um, gay clubs. And there was a big concern among the people who went there, like they didn't want to share information. And so South Korea had to navigate um, how they were going to approach this in a way that was uh, anonymized enough that people felt safe. Um, and so that just, there was something reported about that like today or yesterday. So I didn't see exactly what they did, but they found a way to kind of anonymize testing and, and tracing so that, um, so that people uh, could be notified in a way that their information was not shared with um, the government. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to contribute number four. How about that? Yeah, please. Number four is everybody needs to realize that they're part of a community. And yeah. so like, like if I'm outside and I see somebody wearing a mask, 
what they're saying to me is I care about you. I care about my community. Uh, I want to, I want to help us get through this. Um, and so, uh, there's a balance between, you know, being an independent person and being an independent person who is a member of a community. And, you know, we talked a little bit about expeditionary behavior, right? <laughs> and how, you know, basically, you know, you need to keep in your calculus, the well-being of your team, of your, you know, and the accomplishment of your mission. And our everybody's mission on the planet right now, all 7.7 .7 billion or how many of the people our number one mission is to get rid of COVID-19 right now. And, and how we're going to do that is by acting like a community. And so I'll put that down as number four is, is yeah. realizing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're all in this together. And, and when we think about, you know, we can't think about our, our, ourselves as these lone actors when we, you know, when we're assuming some level of risk, that's not just our risk because that's also risk that we can spread to our communities. And so, um, you know, when we think about young people being at low risk, but then they can spread to their neighbors, their coworkers. And so, we, yeah, we have, we have to, we have to be in it together um, yeah. because that just by the nature of how the virus spreads that it's, it requires everyone to, to, um, to, to be safe, to, to stay safe. Yeah. Well, this has been, you know, we are starting to run out of time. So I want to share a couple of, of really positive comments. <laughs> so, yeah, because um, honestly, it's much better. And I agree with that 100%. The problem, the problem we're in right now is when people don't know the answer, they make one up. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Why? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Good. I appreciate that. Yeah. This is the absolute last call for uh, for questions, but there is there is a comment that I want to also post here. I'll just post that one up there for you. <laughs> oh no, my husband can, but I can't. <laughs> no, no. Everyone always asks that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, in the in the time remaining, you know, is is first of all, is there anything we forgot on our list? Is there anything really critical that we forgot on our list? And also, you know, what and I already asked you this, but maybe if you could, you could comment it on again, you know, what things give you optimism that we're going to, that we're going to get through this? Yeah. Um, I, what gives me optimism? I mean, I think we, we're going to learn from successes. I, it, it, successes are going to keep popping up and they're going to become harder to ignore. And, it's 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 when people really see that there's a way to live safely and they realize that they're not feeling safe themselves that they're going to advocate for really a, um, a safer way to live and um, and then also you know that that sometimes the media can display things as being more polarized than, than they are and, and in fact most people you know um, most people understand the recognize the value of uh, of you know, of these, these interventions and, and so, um, and, and want to keep our community safe. So, you know, it's maybe about finding the right message for that particular person, but I think in general, most, most people want to do the right thing. So, um, so just appealing to, to the, the, the best nature of people. Okay. And did we miss anything on our list or is no, that no, it's good? good? Yeah. Well, well, Natalie, this, this has been so informative. I, I really, really thank you for taking the time. Um, and I think you've, uh, you've provided some really good guidance to a, to a whole bunch of folks and we're going to share this far, far and wide. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. For, thanks for having me. It's fun. And thanks. To, and thanks to everybody to the, for the great comments um, and uh, all the great questions and uh, just to encourage everybody to, to, to tune in next week. So <laughs> All right, everybody, we'll, we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Okay.